Hello and welcome to the Four Wheel Dive Podcast. I'm Tim Masso. He's Kyle Lindsay, YouTube's original king of cars. The Dive and Drive starts now. Kyle made his name in automotive reviews. He's posted thousands. He's a practiced hand at it. But for a couple of years, he's been emphasizing restoration, diaries, and shop talk. The reviews are back. And Kyle, you've got a couple of cool ones. What have you been yeah, I've had a I've had a huge variety of cars over the past several weeks. Um, everything from you know the 2023 Nissan Z to the Hyundai Ioniq 5. I finally uploaded a video I've been holding on for like two years of the uh, 2020 BMW N2 CS, which was wild. And uh, this week I actually had the Kia EV6, which is going to be fun to compare to the Ioniq 5. What, what was your feeling? I mean, performance-wise, this is not top of the line. That's going to be the GT. But for an everyday middle-of-the-market EV, I mean, it's pretty impressive from what I've heard. It really is quite amazing. I know EVs are a hot topic right now, very, very polarizing subject. Um, and when it comes to, you know, reviewing all the ones that I've had a chance to check out lately, you know, you got to keep an open mind. I'm an old school guy at heart, so I like big engines and loud exhausts and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, to be perfectly honest, the Ionic 5 in particular really, really surprised me because the one that I had was a top of the line limited had all-wheel drive. I mean, it, I can't remember the exact numbers right off, but it had really impressive horsepower and torque numbers. And keep in mind, being an electric drivetrain, the torque is pretty much instantaneous. So that thing, especially in sport mode, would absolutely fly and throw you back in the seat. The Kia EV6 has the same electrical architecture as the Ionic 5. It's not exactly the same car, even though they do share a lot of elements. But um, you know, the one that I have is pretty much exactly the same performance wise as the ionic five so it's a lot of fun it handles good and it's just a different experience really you know it's kind of funny you talk about being old school i'm old school too i'm wearing a van halen 1984 tour shirt so you know oh, yeah <laughs> um, so i'm hard rocking the t-top but i'll also say this like there have been tests where people have taken like bone stock ls6 chevelles you know with over seven liters of displacement. You've got a 454 in its highest compression ratio before the emissions equipment came on. And they've run them on dynos and they made like 350 to 360 horsepower, which was really good. Like net horsepower, that's really good. But you compare like the king of muscle cars, like an LS6 Chevelle with like 350 real world horsepower. And then you look at the, you know, the EV Hyundai that you just drove and it, it has 321 net and 446 pound feet. I mean, Look, I, I get that muscle cars make the right sound. They have the right look. But, I mean, the performance doesn't lie. That is stonking for a mid-range model. It really is. And considering that it's it's not even branded as a sports car. I mean, it, it looks sporty. It's, it's actually got this cool like retro futuristic 80s vibe with the little little block detailing and stuff all around i mean it's just it's super cool there's a lot of neat details but like you said when you compare you know what was the king of the crop of performance back in the day i mean I mean, as we all know, a lot of those cars could be dusted by a new Toyota Camry or something. But, yeah. we're, you know, it's the sheer acceleration and overall performance and handling and all that uh, of these EVs. I mean, it's it's awesome. Like I, for one, you know, I, I don't want the gasoline engine to go away. You know, I, I, I can't get rid of my love for the old school stuff. But I am really excited to see where this technology, you know, uh, it leads us. Yeah, I'm not worried about, you know, the old school going away. I think what's going to happen in the long run is, and this is just kind of an aside, but gas powered cars will be like horses. 
like people still absolutely breed and ride and race and show horses. It's a billion dollar industry in Kentucky and you can still legally ride them almost everywhere except highways. So it's going to be like that with gas powered cars. You know, the good news is a lot of the EVs are fun. The EV6, it's fast now, 321 horsepower doesn't lie, but the GT is going to have 577 with 546 pound-feet of torque. <laughs> you take your ZL1, your LS6, your Street Hemi, your L88, none of them can match that. So this is still going to be a lot of fun. Absolutely. You know, I've, I've said for the last five years that for an auto enthusiast, we live in like one of the best times. There is so much technology that is improving performance. Things are so much more efficient. I mean, you've got things like, the Hellcats and whatnot, which unfortunately are leaving after, well, Char Charger and Challenger are leaving after the 2023 model year. So definitely sad about that. But we have all of these like amazing gasoline performance vehicles. And then we yeah. have the complete opposite end of the spectrum that's amazing performance. I mean, it's just, it's awesome. It's exciting. I, I don't care who you are. You have to be excited for what we're dealing with right now. Now you got your hands on BMW m2 cs so the hottest of the hot really this has got to be the spiritual successor to what the m3 used to be e30 e36 e46 they weren't huge cars uh, tell me a little bit about the spiritual successor and that's cs so the amazing thing about that car is its purity like it was built intended to be a just a pure sports car made for driving Tons of carbon fiber, more carbon fiber than the M2 competition. You had a louder exhaust. You had more power. The motor, 444 horsepower, is brought on from the uh, M4 competition. Um, and you just you had so many cool things that just screamed race car. Like the front bucket seats had these cutouts of the back that looked like they could have you know passed a harness through, and you know, which it didn't. It just looked cool. But, I mean, it was just... It was a nice car that had good features, but it didn't have all of this overly, you know, done up type technology and, uh, you know, all the self-driving features and whatnot. It was literally made to drive and it came with a six speed manual. The only downside, the one that I drove had a uh, MSRP of nearly a hundred thousand dollars because uh, it had, yeah, because it had like $9,000 of carbon ceramic brakes and the, uh, the DCT transmission. Um, but, and I think they only made like 400 available for the United States. So it was very limited production, but you know, that car and stuff like that, Unfortunately, I think we are going to start seeing less and less of that because, you know, they, they just don't bring the big dollars in and, you know, volume profits that these manufacturers are wanting. You know, the funny thing is, I, I feel like at the prices they're being offered new resellers on bring a trailer are going to make more money off of this car than BMW ever did. Oh, I believe that it's if you follow the classic car market and, you know, we, this this actually could be a really good topic. But like a lot of the stuff that we've talked about before, like our dream cars of like the 70s, 80s, 90s and whatnot, like all of these things are just going bonkers. All of these specialty cars, because I think people see, you know, not not the light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak, but they see these passionate examples of pure performance cars going away to a degree like there's still always going to be performance cars but the purity of them yeah at some point just with the natural progression of things is going to be lost i definitely agree with that and it's going to become like a connoisseur thing where you know gasoline will be like a special product you buy at like a hobby store yeah. uh, <laughs> it's going to get to that point eventually but uh, it's good that you mentioned markets because before i think we circle around to our talk about your road trip and diamondback classics which is a very cool topic oh yeah a little bit of a market report that's kind of fun to run by first of all something absolutely bonkers insane happened uh this past week somebody went online and paid a hundred thousand dollars for a toyota fj cruiser on bring a trailer <laughs> i know right i know exactly what you're thinking now no previous fj has ever come close to this it was the trail team's edition it was last of the line it had 250 miles on it and a trd exhaust so it had a nice mod from the dealer and it was basically new but still a hundred thousand dollars i don't, don't know. get it <laughs> 
about this. Now you're Toyota and you've got the forerunner and you're thinking like you're, you're crying yourself to sleep every night, looking at the Wrangler and the Bronco and thinking I could have also had the FJ just keeping it in production because the forerunner has been in production in its current generation since 2009. It's based on the platform of the FJ. They share a lot of parts. They could have had a segment buster because the FJ wasn't a true four door, but it wasn't a two door either. It had it had cubby doors. It would have been something that people who like live in cities or the suburbs who don't have room for a four door Wrangler Unlimited or a four door Bronco could have bought to hit that sweet spot between the two door and the four door and only Toyota would have had it. And if you look at what people are willing to pay for one of these things used, just imagine they sell like I think they sell like 190,000 RAV4s a year. They must be crying that they discontinued the FJ, thinking no one would buy it back in 2014. Yeah, I, I believe that. And in my world, <clears throat> keeping an eye on like the auto restoration market and whatnot and talking to clients and stuff, um, you know, a lot of people have a soft spot for those specialty vehicles. And even though a lot of these manufacturers deem it as like, oh, you know, they're not going to bring big enough numbers and whatnot, and yada, yada, yada. There are so many passionate people that do like a lot of these things that, you know, not just Toyota, but there's a lot of other manufacturers too that are not catering to their core fin base. They're, you know, without going into specific examples, you know, taking specific uh, historical name plates and putting them on things that are not exactly, you know, fit yeah. into the original. <laughs> um, but, you know, I see a lot of in the in the auto restoration market and stuff, you know, you see people more oftentimes than not wanting to take these older vehicles and build them how they want with all the creature comforts and stuff, because, you know, if Chevy made a, you know, two door blazer body on frame type deal or whatever, you know, they would buy it, but they can't. So they will just go get an old one and build it accordingly. LS swap it and all that. Yeah. And I, it's interesting you mentioned that because some of these things that didn't sell well when they were new are coming back in their red hot. Like you had your GMT 400 Chevy Silverado in the shop in the last week. I saw it come up on your social, yep. the red Silverado. Well, oh, yeah. Not many people bought the 1995 to 2000 Tahoe two-door, but if you have one of those GMT 400 two-door Tahoes now, and it hasn't been beat to crap, you can get 20, 30, even $40,000 for it. I know it is absolutely crazy. And you know, by that token, you know, obviously with something older, there's, there's going to be maintenance and stuff that you have to do, especially if it's older miles and, or lower miles and stuff like that. But if that's what you really want, you can't buy it anymore. So there are no options. So it's really a seller's market because if you have something like that, it's just about considered specialty at this point. And for something that was, you know, quote mass produced, you know, as, as far as just a run of the mill vehicle back, you know, 20, 30 years ago, it's amazing. Like you said, how some of these are making a comeback in a big way. Yeah, and the interesting thing to me is always when you've got a car that has a chance to become a collectible, there's a period when you stop seeing them on Cars.com and Auto Trader and eBay Motors, and you start seeing them on sites that are specialty retailers of vintage and collectible cars. Like the Lincoln Mark Gate's a great example of that. Five years ago, the only place these things surfaced was with 200,000 miles on Auto Trader, Cars.com, Kelly Blue Book, all these companies that are trying to sell you used cars. Now, you don't see as many of them around, but you're starting to see these twenty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 low-mile California cars, and people who sell you, you know, classic cars for a living are selling them alongside 60s muscle cars. Like, that's become a thing. Yeah, same thing with, like, uh, you know, the Cadillac Bromes of the late 80s, early 90s, the ones yes. uh, that had, like, the Euro headlights, like the Caprices and whatnot. All of those... I call them square bodies too, but like, you know, before they went all round in the, in the early nineties, those late square body bromes, caprices, all of those are going for stupid money. If you find a 91 triple black Cadillac brome with low miles, 20, 30 grand right there. And I'm just like, Whoa, I guess I'll never own one of those. <laughs> you know, it's, it's so funny. You mentioned this because 
it seems like the malaise era cars, like cars from the 70s, uh, a lot of them were emasculated by emissions or they had weird period features and names. I always joke that you like your, your stereotypical American full size luxury car in the 1970s was like the deluxe brome landau classic (laughs) (laughs) absolutely (laughs) opera windows five mile an hour bumpers oh yeah you know (laughs) five thousand pounds 170 horsepower but people want them now like eight liter (laughs) v8s Yeah, like right. it'll be like a, a Ford like 385 460 cubic inch and it's making like 212 horsepower. I know. And you know, but here's the thing, like we laugh, but I'm actually following a 1979 Lincoln Continental Town Coupe right now on Bring a Trailer. <laughs> and it's got 2 days to go. This one's got 12,000 miles. And yep, sure enough, 159 horsepower to move 5,200 pounds, but it's already up to 22,250. So $22,250. There is going to be a bidding war on this. And you can always gauge interest with these things by the number of comments below. It's got 62 comments already. And I've seen Ferrari 550s sell with fewer comments. Yeah. It's there's actually a cool Facebook page that I follow called Malays Motors, and it is dedicated all to that era. So I get to live vicariously with all of these cars that used to be nobody cared about, and now everybody's hot about. And I'm like, y'all stop buying all these cars that I want. All the prices are going to go up. <laughs> I know, I know, because just this weekend I'm watching the 1966 Olds Toronado. I've got like my Oldsmobile shirt in here. People think I wear it to be ironic. I'm like, no, I wear it because I like Oldsmobile. Yeah, um, <laughs> but there was the 66 toro on bring a trailer it wasn't perfect it was pretty good i'd say you know on a like a zero to 100 scale or let's use like the one to five i would say this was like a 3.5 on a one to five scale okay so not like a concord car not like a former concord car that's been driven but you know a fairly messy engine bay which is really how you judge the condition of these things decent paint but a respray and a couple of badges in the wrong place. And I'm thinking, okay, maybe 19, maybe 20, because this car is not perfect. Well, car and driver, conflict of interest, uh, owned by the same company as Bring a Trailer, they put this on their front page and it's a $33,000 car and they ruin it for everyone. I know, I see stuff like that all the time and it just makes me shed a tear. (laughs) Like, y'all stop posting about these cars. (laughs) Let them be a secret for us passionate weirdos. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, here's a car whose brakes didn't work even when they were new. And now it's going to cost me like more money than a well-equipped Miata. Like that that's too much. But yeah, it says auction pick of the day, 66 Oldsmobile Toronado. And that's when I knew I'd lost it. Like there was no way I was going to pick up a bargain. But I might get lucky because I've been following this 1957 Imperial that's bouncing around. Oh, and maybe God. they just picked the wrong auction site. But a company called West Coast Classics has been trying to auction this off on Hemmings. And I just don't think they're there for it. They're trying to get like $49,000. And the auction has failed at least once. So I'm starting to think, well, you always wanted a 392 Hemi 57. Mm-hmm. Maybe worker. <laughs> You know, Saratoga 300 Imperial, like, this is your chance. Give them a call. They say it's original, but for a respray, that's about as good as it gets. So I don't you know. know. You know what the only bad thing is? By just talking about that, you literally just promoted it to everybody listening to this podcast. So it's ruined. <laughs> yeah, guys, I bought it. It's off the market. Forget that. Sorry. <laughs> Let's buy it now. When Kyle said that, I clicked buy it now. We're done. This is finished. <laughs> I thought you were going to say, like, you can't get glass. And I was like, yeah, you're right. You can't get glass. (laughs) Oh, man. What have you been following? Like, are you following any markets for, like, a certain car that's just, like, the it car and you've been thinking about it for years? (laughs) Kind of. It was kind of spur of the moment, and it kind of ties in with our Diamondback story. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Let's let's go in that direction. Tell me this story, and then we'll talk about the road trip. Because I don't even think you know about this car. So while I was at Diamondback, I had the opportunity to film their, quote, test car, which is a 1959 Cadillac Coupe de Ville. Oh, boy. (laughs) That is a bucket list car for me. And if I could show a picture on the on on the podcast, I would. Um, It was amazing. I spent half the day filming it. They let me drive it. It was everything I ever dreamed it would be. And the whole drive back to North Carolina, uh, I was telling Crystal, I was like, okay, 
which all which one of my uh cars can i get rid of can i can i get rid of all of them does anybody want my garbage like <laughs> i need this car how many cars can i trade to have this car instead <laughs> Can I double pump two cars on like one lift, one above, one below, that sort of thing? Yeah. I was like, oh, they can take the fair lane. They can take this and this. See, they can take multiple vehicles to test and I'll just take the Cadillac. <laughs> well, you know, I'm, I'm all for it. I, I'm the worst enabler on earth. So the, here's what happened to me. I loved that car. When I was a kid, I loved 59 Cadillacs when they were junk in the 90s. You could buy like a Coupe de Ville for 10 grand if it was great. Oh my um, gosh. <laughs> I went to a car show when I was in junior high, seventh grade, and the guy who owned it, he had a uh, he had an Eldorado Beeritz convertible, white, Ooh. license plate out of sight, or out of sight, it was spelled out like the Bruce Springsteen song, pink Cadillac, yeah, pulling out of sight, and I'm like, can I buy it from you? And I'm like, you know, I'm 13 or whatever when you're in junior high, and he's like, you got 45 grand? I'm like... That seems like the world to you. But then I'm down at the Amelia Island Concours this past spring, and they got a black one, Eldorado Beer. It's 1959, full restoration estimate, 300000 on the auction block. And I'm sitting there Gosh. thinking, I wish I had that forty five grand back in, like, 1997. I mean, it's just like everything we've been talking about. It's like, like oh, it was in so re such close reach. And then it's like, nope. <laughs> get back I, down there <laughs> no, i feel like i've got to get ahead of the market like i'm talking about the lincoln market i've just, got to just go out and like buy one like before before auction sites and magazines and bring a trailer and social media ruin the market for me i want to go out and get like a 96 lsc where they still had the original 1993 body style with the headlights that were like oh. razor slim but they went with the like the xenon or the high intensity discharge update um you know the lsc option with the true dual exhaust the stiffened suspension like get the 96 body style with all the upgrades get that before someone makes it a sixty thousand dollar car because there ain't many around and that's the problem with cars that were meant to be driven like you look at the ferrari 550 you know super america and everyone knew that was going to be a collectible you look at the bmw 1m everyone knew that was going to be a collectible all of them went into garages it's like the gnx none of them were ever driven but mark eights and two-door tahos and all this stuff they got driven into the ground so you find a good one it's a needle in a haystack. It's harder than finding the collector cars. It's almost the best investment you could do. You know, if you play your cards right and be smart about it, uh, it's 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 amazing. It's like, how, depending on what it is, it's almost better than having money in the bank. <laughs> yeah, especially when, you know, a good one is what, $20,000? You buy the best one in the world for now, but they're starting to move off of like used car sites. Now you're seeing like these collector car specialists begin to recognize what they're worth. And the one thing that goes wrong with all of them is the rear window seal. It gets to the point where if that's the only problem, no matter how bad it is, you pay the man whatever he wants, assuming it's been garaged, lived in Southern California, I'm sold. Low miles, low miles on like that Texid block in tech is like under a hundred thousand. Anything under a hundred grand is low miles on a Texid block. And I'm I'm gonna be it's gonna be really interesting to see like you know some of the stuff that I've been messing with over the last several years like uh, my '89 Nissan 240SX and my '89 yeah. Chevy S10. I've seen a lot of S10s um, you know start to creep up there in value, which the S10 was not a nice vehicle when it came out. It was a utilitarian, cheap little truck, and you know huge in the mini truck scene in the 80s 90s and, and even today um but so many of them have been modified and whatnot and uh, you know my mine included but um you'll see like i've seen like run-of-the-mill s10 four-door blazers you know base models with cloth on some of these specialty uh, uh, websites going for like 14 15 000. and it's like what in the world is happening 240s if you have an original like original sport pack with a manual transmission. I think one on brick trailer sold for like $30,000. And it makes me think, oh my gosh, I should have kept mine stock. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy because the S10, if you think about it, it was the right truck at the wrong time. Like today, I'm going to make a bold prediction. I think the S10 comes back. I think it's going to live again. I think that Chevrolet realizes that the Colorado is not a counter to the Maverick and the sales of the Maverick have proved that there is room for a smaller pickup in the lineup. And I, I would not be shocked because, if it's a laser based S10. 
Absolutely. And, and and if you think about it, the Colorado has gotten big enough that it's almost the size of like a short bed, regular cab Silverado. And it costs almost as much as one. So, you know, for people who want a more affordable option like the Maverick, there there is nothing. And with the availability of the Maverick, everybody's overcharging anyway. So there's that as well. <laughs> I really think the S10 will live again as like the third pickup in the Chevy lineup. Because we look back to our childhood in like the 90s, the, all these midsize, the Tacomas, the Frontiers, the Colorados, they're as big as the full-size trucks from when we were kids. Yep. It's amazing. People used to think the Hummer was just the most uh, obnoxious, large vehicle on the road. I'm talking about the H2 when it came yeah. out. Um, I remember there was such a big stink about those for the longest time. And I, I saw one in the in a parking lot the other day. I was like, holy cow, this thing's small. Like <laughs> yeah. my, my 95 Ford F-350 long bed dually looks small compared to a, a new counterpart. The new Super Duties are huge. <laughs> trucks, are, trucks are so big today. And, and <laughs> I don't even know where to start. They're so huge. They're like, and, and that's not even counting weird, crazy stuff like a Galendowagon 4x4 squared or a 6x6 AMG. Like there's stuff today that didn't even exist back then. <laughs> As we look back in time, a little past our childhoods but you went down to diamondback classics you had a nice long road trip with crystal yeah. you saw the coupe de ville what do they make there because a lot of folks don't know where old style tires come from yeah so diamondback classic radials is in conway south carolina which is right outside of myrtle beach they're one of the last legitimate manufacturers of white wall tires left um, you know, you used to be able to buy like, uh, I think Michelin was the biggest manufacturer, maybe Continental made them too, but you know, in like the two thousands, you could buy, you know, the tires for the grand marquees and whatnot that had the little tiny little white pinstripe on them. They don't even make those anymore. They're all discontinued. So if you want white wall tires, your options are very limited, but at the same time, they don't just make like restoration tires or stock replacement tires. They make, they can make make completely custom tires. So let's say you had a 59 Cadillac on 20s and you wanted a modern radial, but still to have that little bit of resto mod in there, they will put a white wall stripe on a 20 inch tire. I've, I saw it. It was awesome. But they'll do like the red striping, the yellow striping, the, the yellow on white, like Vogue's, like in any size you can imagine. It was fascinating. Yeah, that's a really cool thing because, first of all, a lot of people just kind of, they never think until they get into the classic car hobby about where you find period appropriate tires. I think the assumption is that you go to a tire store. Some of these things are so specialized that it's been years since the original tire was available. Like I talk about the Mark 8, you can't even get the original tire that came with the Mark 8. Yep. So what do you do when it's 40s, 50s, 60s? And it's going to be companies like Diamondback. And there's another fun one, I believe, in Indiana called Kelsey Tire. And they do all the Goodyear licensed tire reproductions. And it makes me so happy that both of these companies actually make these things in the U.S. I swore it would be like imported from Korea, imported from China. They're making this stuff in the United States, and I am here for it. Yeah, I mean, with, with Diamondback in particular, they actually offer multiple different lines of tires to fit any budget and i'll be talking about this in a uh, two or three videos that i that i'll be putting out one on one on a 56 ford thunderbird one on my 56 crown vic and of course talking about it in the 59 cadillac review but you know let's say you don't care about the the straight up authentic look like with the pie cut edges and stuff of like the old bias plies they'll take a new radial that you can just order from any tire shop and vulcanize it and put the white wall on it that and cool. it sounds super expensive and it is a little bit more expensive than your regular tire but it is a lot more budget friendly but then at the, on the other end of the spectrum they have their auburn line which is a fully modern radial tire but it looks identical to a classic bias ply like uh like the old firestone uh, gum dip tires yes. um we got those for this 56 thunderbird so from the outside it's going to have a two and a half inch white wall just like the one i got for the crown vic 
um, but it's got the pie cut edges and stuff, so it's going to look authentic. It's it's just really, really cool. <laughs> it's the neatest thing to me because all of this is being done at the artisanal level. Like if you're going to make a white wall out of a modern radial that was not, you're scooping out the fl you're scooping out the side wall. You're filling it with latex. You're doing th you're doing individual operations on tires. Any modern tire factory, the whole thing is automated. So this idea of artisanal tires is really appealing, and it's great when the molds for the original still exist and modern technology can be used with steel belted radials, more modern compounds, but they can maintain the original like sidewall to tread transition, uh, the tread patterns, all the things that give them like their personality. Like Kelsey also does military tires. You know, I used to work at a World War II museum. We had like we had we had trucks. And we had aircraft. And I always wondered, well, what's going to happen when these 75-year-old rock-hard tires finally expire? Like, these are pneumatic tires, so we've just been replacing the tubes. But what happens when this thing just, like, cracks in half? Well, thanks to vintage tire production, we're never going to have to put a modern wheel on it in order to get a compatible tire. No, and it's it's so important now more than ever, especially with the classic car hobby and and the more vintage stuff like like looking back pre 1960s, finding out like deliberately going out and seeking out these you know quote smaller companies, these family owned companies like Diamondback that do all of this stuff by hand. All of their tires are made to order. Going out of your way to make sure to support all of these companies to you know not only maintain the authenticity of your classic car but you also get the safety benefits and everything of a modern yeah. tire and you know in general like it is more important now than ever before to support these businesses because it will keep the hobby alive for years and years to come and remember if you own a first generation dodge viper this now applies to you tires that cannot be obtained for relatively recent vehicles are going to have to be made by companies like this Absolutely. Speaking of which, that was a dream car of mine, the original the original 92 Viper, because it was transcendent. When I was a little kid in like third grade and the Viper just came out, I had this 70-year-old elementary school teacher who was super excited about something one day. And I asked her why she was so happy. And she just entered a raffle to win a Dodge Viper. And that just says it all about like the appeal of the Viper. Everyone instinctively loved or hated that car. Kyle, yeah a little bit about like your dream cars and like the lessons learned in the process because i have hit so many landmines some of the dreams have become nightmares <laughs> so i actually owned a viper um it was it was my dream car at the time it was a 2013 so it was the first year of the last generation and you know everything happens for a reason i wish i had it right now because i could actually make a whole bu <laughs> a whole bunch yes. of money on it but uh i had that car for about a year or so i put like 5,000 miles on it or so. And it was, it was absolutely amazing. But, you know, at that time, uh, my wife and I were kind of in a life transition we wanted to sell our current house, move out to the country, buy some land. I wanted to build my shop and all that stuff. So I made the best decision for uh, me and us at the time. And I'm very fortunate for that because it, you know, gave me, gave me my first shop. But, um, there are so many things that I want. <laughs> I'm gonna, I want that 59 Cadillac really bad. <laughs> I want that to happen for you. I, I want I want that to happen for you, and I want you to get the king of the 59s. I want you to have an El, El Dorado Tri Power. I want you to have the Beeritz convertible. I want it to be pink. I want that dream to happen for you. <laughs> All right. If anybody listening to this has one of those, I will trade every vehicle I own. <laughs> Yeah. And, and I'll throw in a motorcycle too if it's Mary Kay pink. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> but you know, hey, I, I love the '59, obviously. But um, if I had to pick another newer dream car, it would probably be a Challenger Hellcat Red Eye wide body because oh, and of course with a manual yes. um, because that is to me the epitome of the modern muscle car. I you know the big difference between you know, the big three, Camaro, Mustang, Challenger, they're all very different from one another. Challenger is big. It's heavy. It's also comfortable. It's got a usable back seat. It's more grand touring than the other two. But that is the only one that, in my opinion, still embodies what it means to be a muscle car. And I love it. I've driven all of the Challengers all the way up to the Demon 
you know, going down the drag strip. And that's just it for me. That car is just wicked. <laughs> yeah, I got to admit, I never loved Supercharger wine until the Hellcat. And then I learned to love Supercharger wine. And the Red Eye is definitely the one to own. Because I remember when the Hellcat first came out, I, I walked around to the back instinctively and I'm like, wow, these are really narrow tires. They're, they're, they're spinning out 700 pound feet of torque on this. At least with the red eye, you, the tires have a fighting chance, <laughs> not a good <laughs> chance, but a chance of hell maybe. Oh, I know it's, it's, I think they were 275 width tires in the back, which is the exact same size as an SRT 392, which had 475 horsepower. Yeah, there was so... a little <laughs> delta there. <laughs> absolutely but it's just those nutty things that I, I just i just love about dodge and I'm, I'm i'm gonna miss when those those cars are out of production yeah you know it's it's funny because the challenger originally it was an e-body it was a mid-size it was it was, it was mm -hmm. a small car by the standards of its day and then the challenger came back on basically the lx platform and it, it's almost like more a successor to like one of the b bodies like the roadrunner like the really big mopars at the time because you get in a challenger and it feels so big and you've got space to stretch out and the camaro today is a sports car the mustang the mustang's got like one foot in the muscle car world one foot in the sports car world and the challenger is just no apologies politically incorrect it's loud it's proud it's a big heavy traditional american muscle car that happens to be built in ontario but that's beside the point yeah we'll, we'll just ignore that <laughs> we'll give them credit it's north america um <laughs> So it's it's funny you mention all of these dream cars that have come and gone. I've had two D2 generation Audi S8s, and I learned so many lessons about the cost and complexity of old European cars. So when I first got out of boot camp, the first thing I did out of Navy OCS was I went and I bought the best 2003 Audi S8 I could find with my dad down at a dealer back in 2003. We'd We'd seen one, and it was the hottest thing on earth. Five valves per cylinder, revs to seven thousand RPM. You know, it's the size of a D, you know, D series, D class, full size sedan, but it weighs as much as, you know, like a like an E class or a five series. And I'm just in love, and and I've got this dream of the car. And when I'm sitting like at attention. Um, in rifle drill, I'm thinking like, I'm going to buy that car, I'm going to buy that car, I'm going to buy that car. And that's like the thought that got me through OCS. And so I get out and I buy the best one possible. And it's so cherry. It's got like 60,000 miles on it. It was owned by the lead tech at a Volkswagen dealer. Everything lined up. It was a former corporate lease car, perfect in every way. But what I didn't know is that these European cars are designed with the anticipation that people will actually take care and garage them. And if you park them under trees, they have these rain gutters inside the roof and underneath the cowl. And these drains are about, I don't know, the lines are maybe as thick as my pinky finger. And we have pine needles in the US and we have acorns and we have seeds and we have leaves and these things get clogged. So I'm down at Pensacola Naval Air Station, Pensacola. I wake up one morning after a Florida downpour and I get in my car and I slide into my seat. I put my feet down, sploosh. Oh no. And there's six inches of water inside the car and I'm panicking now. And wow. I turn it on every warning light in the world goes off. The, the car has got computers in the floor. So, you know, the ECU is under the cowl. That's flooded. The computers in the floor that deal with things like the transmission and, uh, you know, comfort and convenience and climate control, they're on the fritz. I get out of the car. I start pa panicking. What do you do when you've got 100 gallons of water in your car? And so naturally, I go into the house and I get a cup and I start bailing it out. While I'm bailing it out, the windows start raising and lowering themselves. The lights start flashing. The alarm goes off. And the car was so fried from that one flooding. Everything else about it was perfect. It never recovered from basically being a flood car. That's what it was. And this was a lesson to me. You really need to be an expert in these things and know what to look for because the car was perfect. It passed an OBD2 scan. I put it up on a lift. Everything was perfect. But it had enough silt in these drains that when it got down to Florida from New York, the rain they get down there was enough to kill it. Wow, that's that's amazing. 
that's the lesson. So guys, it's the same thing for like the C5 generation Audi A6. And it's true of a lot of German cars today. They may make them in the U.S. today. But even a German car made in the U.S. is not set up to sit underneath a tree and then deal with Florida rainfall. After five, six, seven years, you will have the problem I had. Get ahead of it. So yeah, that's that's the type of stuff that you would only know about from experience as well. Um, it's, it's like uh, you know another thing that I wanted to say as far as you know going out and trying to you know finding your dream car and and knowing if it's the right thing to do and all that kind of stuff i know for me when it comes to certain vehicles uh you know i i've I've purchased too many vehicles in the last few years um the number one thing that i would recommend is to not let your passion overrule your uh mentals (laughs) your your, yeah yeah. (laughs) right because you know for me a lot of my dream cars are older, um, especially pre sixties. So when you're dealing with stuff like that, there's a whole nother ball game that you need to look out for. It's not necessarily with the electronics. It's with previous repairs and body work and making sure you're not buying something full of Bondo and lead. So getting the right eye to, go over the car and look it over appropriately, you know, touch and feel, looking for certain things. It is very, very important. It's like, uh, you know, with this Crown Victoria I bought. It's a really nice car that was fully restored about yeah, 10 to 15 years or so ago. Um, but it did sit around for a while, and it was great. When I looked at it, I didn't look at it as close as I should have. And then... A couple weeks after I bought it, it started leaking every single fluid that it had, even gasoline. So, (laughs) yeah. So, (laughs) that's another story. But uh, I have since fixed all of that and have some more things on my list and whatnot. Some of these things I could have found out before I bought it if I looked extra, extra close. But I didn't. So, it doesn't matter if you're looking at something from the 1950s or something from the 2000s. If it is legitimately your dream car, and especially if it's a dream car that's going to require you to open up your wallet a little further, make sure to do the proper research and your due diligence. Know what to look out for and look it over tooth and nail because there is nothing more depressing than potentially buying your dream car you know even if it's 30 50 thousand plus whatever and then over the next few weeks you start noticing this and that and whatnot because the excitement will turn into depression really really quick (laughs) and here's another important thing look you can be an expert on a car and if you're buying remotely no matter how expert you are unless you can go out and make that pre-purchase inspection yourself, you're going to have to rely on someone who knows what the hell's going on, preferably a specialist in that model and that era to go look at it for you. So true story. I own a C5 Corvette 2002. Great car. 3,250 pounds, V8, six-speed rear-wheel drive. I love it. But the guy I sent to inspect it was an NCRS, so National Corvette Restoration Society. Um, He was an NCRS judge, but his expertise was in things like tank stickers and protecto plates and serial number ranges to make sure that the distributor in a 65, you know, L84 matches to the engine serial number and the transmission serial number. So he knew all this stuff about old cars. But he didn't know how to inspect a C5 in all the ways that matter. Like, what do you do if you've got a car with a fuel line that operates at 35 PSI? Well, you check the fuel filter underneath the rear wheel because that's where it is. Um, You know, all the things that are electronic, all the things that are modern that deal with systems like fuel injection and disc brakes that didn't exist then, traction control systems and ABS, he didn't know what he was looking at. So I got a physical report on the condition of the car. And by the standards of a 60s Corvette, a garaged 2002 is going to look great. So he's like, this is a number two, maybe a number one awesome car. I love it. I'm like, okay, well, I paid an expert to take a look at it. But he was an expert in cars that are, you know, basically 50, 60 years old. I got the car and I had to deal with things like uh, glitching electronics. I had to deal with things like a leaking fuel filter. I had to deal with things like um, scratches on the underbody that are acceptable on a 60 year old car, but not on a 20 year old car. 
and interior condition that would have been awesome by 1960s standards, but by the standards of a 20-year-old car, there was wear and tear that looked to me like it should have been on a cheaper car than I bought. So make sure oh. you, you hire the right guy, not just the right brand and the right model, the right era and the right systems. Right. That's, that's a good thing to know. And don't let your heart get ahead of your head. And I've done this because I bought the original Fisker Karma. Word to the wise. Really? <laughs> I bought. <the laughs> I didn't last... know this. Okay. Oh, we have a story here. I bought the oh, last yeah. one on MSO. So this thing was still on the floor of a Fisker dealer in 2015. It had never been sold. Wow. And I walked in, looked at a car that had an original retail price of $112,000. I realized it was three years later. This thing had 200 miles. And I just off the cuff, I said, give you 58 grand. And they're like, okay. I'm like, That's <laughs> <your first line." laughs> That's first line. Please take this. <laughs> so I'm like, okay. <laughs> like, I didn't know. It's like, I, I'm the dog. I bought the car. What do I do now? So I, I bought it and I, I had the original Fisker car. I'm at, and I'm like, okay, I know these things reasonably. I've got a serial number about 1100. I should be okay. That's a high serial by the standards of the Fisker Karma. So I'm like, all the horror stories, they happened on early build cars. I'm like trying to convince myself that I haven't made like the biggest mistake of my life. <laughs> and so in two weeks after buying that car, almost all the stuff that happened with my flooded Audi happened with the non-flooded Fisker which I cannot overemphasize. Oh no. Sat in the showroom and had 200 miles. Windows going up and down, alarms going off, infotainment systems that needed to like boot up that would randomly unboot themselves, um, doors that I was sincerely afraid would lock me in, and all sorts of weird powertrain glitches because they had this GM like Ecotech from a Solstice GXP and that was made into like Fisker's own software and like electric hardware from a company called A123 Systems, which went bankrupt. Um, so it, the whole car was just like a mess. And it's one thing if you buy a DeLorean and it's a mess, but it's all basic nuts and bolts that you can fix over time. This was electronics. So I reached out to the one guy in South Florida he goes by Harley guy online, but uh, yeah, he was the one guy who was doing work on these. And I went to his shop and in that shop, I saw like a forensic lab of Fisker parts. There were battery packs that had been disassembled to replace individual pouches. I saw cars that were stripped down to shells. I saw engines that he, or engines, their motors, motors that he was rewinding. And he had an emulator on a laptop that ran the original Fisker scan tool. And I'm like, Oh my God, this oh. is what it takes to keep the thing going. So there's a happy ending to this story. After the car basically tried to kill me by shutting down on a highway, and I mean, it turned itself off. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Fortunately, 85 mile an hour Florida traffic. I was on the, you know, I was on the right hand side by that point. No left hand, like, you know, streamlining in that car. You, you ride on the right, so you're near the shoulder. Um, and it, it basically just shut itself off and thank god it didn't like lock up the drive so it didn't screech to a halt but i coasted off to the side of the highway with no power and i'm like now i know why the dealer sold this to me for fifty eight thousand. but the happy ending is like i managed to sell it for 52 so compared to like <laughs> fixing it like re-engineering the car and fixing everything fisker did wrong i felt like i got a fun story for my six grand absolutely <laughs> <laughs> I got a fun story out of it. <laughs> that is wild. And look, it had the loudest possible paint. It had this blue metallic uh, with, with metallic chips in the paint. And I had people pull up shouting expletives at me about how cool the paint was. And, you know, some of them were like 60 years old. And you'd be like, you don't talk like that, Grandma. Like, that's not right. Like, what is this? Well, first of all, it's Florida. Grandma does talk like that. Second, the paint was that crazy. And the car looked like a concept car on the road. Like, this is one of those times where between the engineers and the stylists, the stylists won every battle with predictable results. 
that car looked the business, but for, you know, a few grand, I got to drive it for a few months and I've got a great story about a bullet that I pretty much dodged. That is amazing. <laughs> Cause I've always thought those were just the neatest cars. And, and it was kind of like, kind of like one of those, I think one of our topics is like, you know, cars that we really, really want that nobody else wanted. That was going to be one of them. And I'm like, Ooh, maybe not. <laughs> well, here's the thing the, they're alive again and they have a less busted version of it called the GS six. The, the, the first, they started with the Rivero that became the Rivero GT, which in turn was less busted than the Rivero, which in turn was less busted than the Fisker. Now they have the GS six, which is the least busted version yet. And that might be a fun three-year-old used car buy for me because I will absolutely do this again. I'm a recidivist Fisker guy. I will do this again. <laughs> we'll make all the same mistakes. We, we, we love to suffer. <laughs> you must have more stories because I've bought a lot of cars. You've bought a lot, a lot of cars. I've bought a lot of mistakes. <laughs> So I'll uh, let's 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 pick a couple. Let's pick one from a while back, and let's pick one from the last year. So, <laughs> a while back, I bought a '57 Jaguar. Okay. Um, my dad found this car through a friend of a friend uh, that was selling it. Um, kind of a sad story. The guy had like stage four cancer, and this was his pet project. You know, he's he was working on it for years and years, and and he just had to sell it for medical reasons. And my dad and I went to go look at this car, and um, it was pouring down rain. But this was a pretty car. I don't remember what the model was, but it was Ford four door Jaguar. So it had a mid eighties Ford three point eight V six or whatever from an LTD. Um, it was a dog. It was so slow. Um, you know, it drove okay in the neighborhood. I could tell that there was a little bit of ish going on with the rocker panels, but I didn't know what I was looking at at the time. That was before I got knee deep into the restoration work. So, you know, the money was right. I paid like five grand for it. It had a bunch of re-chromed parts. So, I mean, it was, it was nice, you know, custom dashboard. It was wood, but it wasn't the original one. Anyway, so I drove this car an hour home, halfway home in the pouring down rain, the wiper stopped working, and then five minutes from home, the brakes stopped working. So <laughs> I managed to get this car coasted into my garage. Yeah, and uh, so the next day I called a local shop and I was like, hey, I need a, you know brakes fixed or whatever, a line, a line blew. Um, so I loaded it up with fluid enough to just limp it to the shop because I didn't have a trailer and truck at the time. <laughs> and uh, I dropped it off and I came back home. And they called me when I got home, like almost immediately. And they were like, you might want to come back and look at this thing before we do any work on it. And I was like, why? And they were like, you might want to just come up. And I was like, oh boy. So bum, bum, bum. yeah. So the ish with the rocker panel that I saw was actually uh, riveted sheet metal that was put on instead of a rocker panel. So the, every rocker panel was gone. It was basically bent around sheet metal that was like cut every like inch and a half and riveted together. If you can imagine millions of rivets, underneath this car with this rocker, these rock custom, custom quote, custom rocker panels. The, every body mount was rusted off. It was gone. The body was held to the frame by hopes and dreams. The trunk was gone. It was just fiberglass. The frame was gone in most places. There were gaps of missing frame about two feet wide at the back. It was, it was toast. So we fixed the brake line and I took it home and never drove it again. And I ended up selling it for what I paid for it. Somebody was willing to tackle it. And, you know, it was it was fair considering the amount of chrome on the car. But that was bad. That could have gotten really bad. I got lucky on that. That's like the, my Fisker story. You got I know. <laughs> probably my most recent mistake is probably an 85 Monte Carlo SS that I still have. Um, I bought that last summer. It wasn't really a good deal, but it was something. Um, it was an original car that was like just kind of wore out. Um, 
locally so i was like you know that that was cool but i always wanted one of those uh g body monte carlos and um i wanted to do some kind of build or restoration with it so i ended up going down this rabbit hole of um i replaced the 305 with a new 305 because i'm an idiot instead of just putting a 350 in it <laughs> and i ended up doing a, a completely custom tuned port fuel injection system um because as you know they never put tune ports on G bodies. It was just Camaros and uh, Corvettes. It was the E carb, right? Yeah, yeah, the Rochester E carb. And uh, so, anyway, my buddy Joe built a completely custom wire harness, standalone ECM. I had a you know a chip burned for it, and did all the ECM upgrades and stuff. It's got a lot of bolt-ons. Very, very nice car. I mean, it's fun for what it is. It's definitely faster than it was. It's not like a you know crazy tire burner or anything, but. That car is like my Christine. <laughs> I touch it and fix one thing and 10 other things go wrong. I finally got it completely dialed in. Um, you know, everything was working great and whatnot. And I was on my last test drive coming home. And then a big old smoke cloud started pouring out behind me because I think I haven't looked at it yet, but I think the transmission uh, pump exploded because when it was running, it was gushing trans fluid out from it and at that point i was like you know what forget this thing i put it underneath the carver a cover because out of sight out of mind and i got other things to do so i hope to continue the build at some point i may if given the opportunity i may ls swap it and actually build it proper to where it's actually worth something but uh i've got enough things to build so i just put it to the side for now <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's funny. We've we've made every kind of mistake. I've got another one. When I bought my second like D2 Audi S8. So this was this was again that 2001 to 2003 car. Um okay, this was the Audi S8 designed based on the A8 of the 1990s. Everyone remembers the S8 from Ronin. But back in 1994, the Audi A8 was the first space frame aluminum passenger sedan and it was considered to be very prestigious very innovative but it was destined to be a niche product and i learned from my second s8 now we're further down the line i bought my first one back in 2009 when i got out of uh, boot camp i bought my second one in 2016 it's now a much older car which means the condition wasn't quite the same and there was some aftermarket stuff on it that i didn't like like a grill insert and wheels so that I, I just wanted to put it back to stock so it was the car i remembered from you know my high school years i wanted it to be exactly like i remembered it and i started to realize the more things i needed to replace that parts availability for a car you're going to buy is essential Volkswagen Group could not care less about those old D2 A8s and S8s. Audi could not care less about it. Audi of North America could not care less. And because these things were so rare when they were new, they did not continue to stock parts for them. I searched for three months to find a set of wheels. I searched for eight months to find the little wood veneer bezel that goes around the shift lever. I searched for most of a year to find a stock grill with the logo that was originally fit to the car. And, you know, that even some mechanical parts were hard to find if they were S8 specific. So you can go out and there are warehouses full of Studebaker Lark parts to this day. When I wanted to buy, as soon as I bought my C5 Corvette, the glove box fell open and the latch was broken and whatever. I went out and I look, I can buy a latch for a C5. This is going to be easy. GM will have it. Not only did GM have it, there were four different vendors with different prices and I picked the best one. That yep. was easy as pie. I literally spent all of a year trying to revert my S8 to the way I remembered it in the showroom. And I never got all the way there because parts for the car just don't exist. And that's that is a really true. good point. That's true of a lot of modern low volume cars. Be real careful, especially if it was made overseas. You can buy Corvette parts from the 50s. God help you if you need wheels for an S8 from 2003. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Any more nightmares before we part, Kyle? Oh, man. My next one is going to be some sort of uh, 1950s cruiser. I'm leaning toward a 57 Mopar. What could possibly go wrong? They weren't right when oh. they were new. <laughs> Nothing, nothing could go wrong with that. <laughs> yeah, it, it I mean, not, if if I if I had to, well, it's not really a nightmare. Eh, no, I'm going to be positive and say there's nothing else. <laughs> okay. 
you you want to know the minefield I'm going through. I saw this Chrysler 300C 1957. It was it was at a dealer for about 80 grand. And I'm like, okay, that's roughly the market for a 300C coupe from 57. Why isn't this car moving? It was sitting, sitting, sitting. And then eventually I'm looking through the listing and I see the reason. An oil pan without a plug, which means everyone who called about this car eventually found out that it wasn't the A488 torque flight that was specific to the 57 300s. It was a 1960s A727, and it was a post-64 because that was the year they expanded the life of the transmission fluid, and it no longer had an integral drain plug on the bottom. So this car had a late 60s A727 torque flight on it, and this was conveniently not declared in the advertisement. Everyone who called about this car managed to figure it out. And that was the reason it had an incorrect transmission. So not only was this not original, it wasn't even the right machine underneath the car. So you got to be real careful. I'm, I'm hoping that I know enough about these things to buy with confidence because Lord knows there aren't too many 1957 Mopar specialists out there. Well, you know, that's 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 a really good point. Like uh, with my Crown Vic, it has the original ford automatic uh, automatic transmission. And in the very light research that I've done, it's that is a more specialty transmission too. you know, compared to like a GM Turbo 350, Turbo 400, which is a dime a dozen. And every Tom, Dick and Harry has worked on one. The ford automatics are a little bit more specialty. They've got bands inside and, and stuff like that that actually require adjustments and whatnot. And, you know, this this might be a good topic for a future episode, too. But, you know, there's going to be a, good, a, a point in time where some of these more specialty things are not going to be able to be fixed. So unless you become the expert and, and digest the entire shop manual from 1956, um, you're going to have to figure out an alternative method, which maybe is what happened with that 57 that you're talking about. I've actually seen conversion kits to where I can put a GM transmission on the back of that Ford Y block with an adapter kit. Um, so I think, you know, there is going to be a, a point in time too, where we're going to have to start getting creative with the cars that we love to keep them on the road. That's a fact. And I, I don't, I, I don't have a crystal ball, but I can say with some of, um, some of the newer cars, Hey, if you got a Lamborghini Diablo and the ECU ain't working, you're not going to get a new one from Lamborghini. You need microelectronics repair to get that thing going again. And that is the future of the collector car hobby. We need propeller heads who are microelectronics literate and willing to get in there and remove individual chips and resistors and connections. This brave I can't, I can't even imagine. I mean, just think about my 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 uh, Challenger Hellcat dream car, whatever. Yes. Imagine those cars in 30, 40 years. The entire car is controlled by that central screen. Yeah. What happens when that screen goes bad? <laughs> I don't know what happens when Teslas are out of warranty. They came out in 2012. So for most of their existence, Model S's have been covered by, you know, the standard 100,000 plus mile eight year warranty thing. We're out of that range now. This this is a new world. That's why, like I said, you want to buy a classic car, go out, get a Studebaker Lark. There are warehouses in the Midwest <laughs> full of parts. You're good to go forever. Just stick Absolutely. to that. You'll never go wrong. <laughs> Kyle, where can they find you online? YouTube, Sob Kyle 04, and Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Sob Kyle 04, LLC. You can find me, Tim underscore Masso, on Instagram. Well, that's the dive and that's the drive.